Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me just briefly introduce the two of us. So I have Donna here with me in Washington. Donna's based in the US and she's the president of the ACMP. Um, I arrived yesterday on a flight that got in quite late, so um, I'm still time adjusting. Um, I'm based in the UK, live in Wales, and I'm currently the vice president of the ACMP. Um, and we're looking forward to sharing with you um, not just uh, explanations around what we're doing in change management, but also reinforcing how strongly that connects to program and project management. Both Donna and I have backgrounds in uh, delivery, um, and so change management is very much something that builds on some of the prior experience we have, and uh, hopefully some of that will be of interest to you. I'm going to hand over to Donna, and she's going to continue with the first half of the presentation. Thanks, Rihanna, and hello, everyone. So a little bit about ACMP, and thank you, Colin and Rhiannon, for the introduction. The key points you need to take away from here is our goal is to advance the discipline and profession of change management, and our focus is on the realization of results. So our objectives for our time together today are fourfold. We want to give you the bigger picture view. What's currently going on in the state of the change management profession? Then we'd like to show you the definition of change management that was um, derived from a tremendous amount of work uh, by the collective body of global practitioners that make up ACMP and our many volunteers, and we'll tell you more about that. Then we'd like to share um, from an action standpoint of the specific things ACMP is doing in our mission to advance the discipline of change management. And finally, and Probably most important to each one of you, what are some practical applications of the ACMP standard for change management? So that's the what's in it for you. Uh, we look forward to sharing all of that with you in the upcoming hour. So how many of you can relate to this? You might feel that change is never ending. It's a part of the landscape today, and it's coming at us from every direction. And no matter how hard we try, it's not going to change. There's external change, there's internal change, it's just part of what's going on. And that is just one of the factors that we observe in the uh, world around us. So for those of you who love to hike or enjoy outdoors and nature, you might recognize this picture. It's a cairn, and what it does is it gives you an indication of where you're going along your journey, along the path. And these are just a few of those indicators that we observed. First, more change than ever is occurring, and it's change that matters, change that impacts people. Secondly, it's very unfortunate, but the rate of success when it comes to doing change isn't necessarily getting better. And finally, the market is really looking for some consistency and some guidance. So when people talk about change management from one organization to another, they mean the same thing. So these are all some of the factors that we observed in the world around us. So as a response to all of those observations, we ask the question, what if? So in 2009, the idea of having an association for change management professionals was raised as part of a World Cafe exercise at a global conference on change management. We asked the question, what would be the value of a professional association? What about a standard or, or a professional credential? And what would be the knowledge, skills, abilities of a change professional if we were to create consistency in this field called change management? So this was the question that we asked. And this is the journey that we embarked upon. And we'll talk about this a little bit later in our conversation today. But just to give you some context, we were officially incorporated in February of 2011, launched um, the membership organization, and we've had the privilege of gathering over 2,000 members from around the world who have helped launch over a dozen chapters. Our very first chapter was in Africa and now there's many more all around the world. And in fact, this isn't our only way of gathering people who are interested in change. We've held conferences in Africa, the Middle East and North Africa, 
and in Europe, including Copenhagen and London. But this isn't about us. We're here to share with you what we've learned along our journey. So what we've learned, we started off with doing some market research. And you can read here one of the things, a couple of things that we learned. First of all, there's fragmentation. So there's inconsistency from practitioner to practitioner, organization to organization. And there's a need in the marketplace to create some consistency. In addition to that, what we found in the market research was over a third of the organizations have had some form of a change management office, maybe a strategic change office, um, some subset of a project management office or program management office. But almost three quarters of the change management practitioners also fulfill other professional roles. And I'm sure that's reflected as you've been doing your introductions. Many of you wear multiple hats. So that's what we've learned as part of our market research. So our response to this was the development and the establishment of change management as a profession. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, just as accountants, architects, engineers, and doctors are part of a profession, it was our goal to build the profession of change management. And there's three pillars or three building blocks that compose a profession. First of all, you can see here, there's a standard and a professional credential, which is different than certification. So the standard is the agreed upon um, practice of the profession credential consists of experience, education, and an exam. And those three components make up a professional credential, just as you would expect for architects, engineers, and doctors. Secondly, we've got the membership organization. So when you become part of a profession, you create a membership organization. And finally, a code of ethics and professional conduct, which is observed and monitored by the professional community and that would be the profession of change management. So that was our response to what we learned. So back to our journey. In August of 2012, ACMP chartered the Standards Working Group. Over the past two years, this group of 28 members from around the globe conducted the market research on change management, followed by the practice analysis and then the development of the ACMP standard for change management. This process followed ISO standards to ensure that it was rigorous, inclusive, and unbiased. The, the standards working group facilitated a public comment period on the first draft of the ACMP standard in March of this year. We received comments from over 1,100 change practitioners from more than 50 countries who provided over 3,500 valid comments, each of which were addressed by the Standards Working Group team. So it's really important to note that this was not limited to ACMP members. We opened this to the entire change community. It was global participation. Over 35% of the respondents were not members of ACMP, and over 46% of the people who participated had more than 10 years of change management experience. Anybody who, prov anyone who participated has their name on the website. So that's a little bit of our journey and how we got to where we are right now. Yes, we've got quite a few large scale projects, certainly multiple projects, and I think that the information you're sending through is evidencing the fact that you know most organizations are hitting and impacting individuals in the business with multiple changes rather than just one or two changes or sequential changes. Excellent. So we've got some definitions coming in here as well. Shall I just call these out? Um, so we've got uh, people skills, definition of management that is not operational or strategic, the process for controlling change, the control and guidance of organizational changes to improve the business of the organization, techniques to achieve behavior change, um, structured process, discipline and control. Um, so quite a variety of things here from the behavioral to the structure to the control. Um, some great responses. Please keep sending them through um, because we'll be able to gather up this information at the end of the webinar 
and um, we'll discuss then with APM how we can play back with you some of the definitions you shared with us. Fantastic. Thanks, Rhiannon, and thanks everyone for those definitions. So as you can see from the variety of answers, that everybody has great insight and appreciation for change management, but not necessarily consistency. So what, we, what we're looking at is um, the launch of the standard. This is the standard for change management. And as I mentioned, the process for getting here um, helped us create the standard, but here's our definition. So how ACMP defines change management is the practice of applying a structured approach to transition an organization from a current state to a future state to achieve expected benefits. So that's what we um, collectively came to agree upon. So that's just the definition of change management. The value and the benefits of a standard uh, consist of all of the things you see listed here, from creating a consistent vocabulary or lexicon, a common understanding of the terms within change management, to capturing generally accepted practices. These are all the benefits that accrue from having a consistent standard for change management. So the standard, what exactly does it represent? Well, in, in the standard, what you'll find is a definition of the various practices, some of the process groups, and we'll talk about those a little bit later in the webinar as well as some of the key tasks and activities. But what you won't find are tools or templates. So the standard serves as a foundation for a professional credential. The reason for this slide is that it's really important that you understand the context within which the standard was created. For those of you who practice in a variety of different disciplines, you know that change management requires um, an understanding of communication, project management, human resources, strategy, a whole variety of different professional disciplines and capabilities. But what we also recognized is there's already been tremendous work in those fields. Everything from human resources to communication, training, and project management have excellent developed disciplines with standards of practice. So what we decided was rather than trying to supplement a professional standard with something that's already been developed, we decided to remain focused on those things which are exclusively related to change management. So we acknowledge that there's many other disciplines that play into the successful practice of change management, but for the intention of the standard that was developed, it was focused solely on change management. And that's what you'll see uh, when you take a look at the standard for change management. We don't include any um, connection in terms of trying to opine on the disciplines that are related. So that's something that's important to understand and next we'd like to turn to one of the burning questions of the day that Rhiannon will help address and that is what is the connection between project management and change management? Yes, I just want to say a special thank you to Peter, who says that he's very encouraged that 26% of organizations apply a structured approach, because that means there should be some useful case study material available. And Peter, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and again, that's one of the reasons why having the special interest group as part of APM, I think is um, a real bonus, because surely that's a, a great place for people who are in the project management discipline to start sharing their case study information around how change management is being deployed in their um, organizations and in their projects. Um, and that question, uh, there was another question that came up about the connection with interfaces with other standards such as PMI and API. Um, again, it's a great question. Um, one of the things that Donna and I are having in, in common, and I think it's, um, it's germane to our change management work, is that we love really good questions. Um, we don't always know the answers, and in this case, I don't have a specific answer for you, other than we've got very active conversations going on with PMI, APM, with um, OD um, groupings as well. Our goal is to be integrative and to work uh, well alongside other professional associations, as well as other um, professionals in our working environment who come from different disciplines 
Um, we're at the very early stages with regards to um, the development of this discipline, the standard being the first part of the, um, the foundation, if you like, the first part of the jigsaw puzzle. So we're currently working on other projects that are around credentialing, and we'll tell you a little bit more about those in a minute. But as part of developing that credentialing, we are certainly looking very closely at what other professional associations are doing to ensure that we are in harmony um, with, with um, the, the whole landscape. So not a very specific answer to your question, but hopefully an indication that we know it's a good question. Um, so I just on this slide, just wanted to, to kind of pause on that question around the relationship between project management and change management. Um, and this is a question that's very close to my heart because my background is in project management. So I started my life as a software developer um, and rapidly moved into project support because I seem to be somewhat better at that than I was at software development. Um, so I rescued the world from some very badly developed systems. Um, but from project support into project management, from project management into program management, from program management into change management. So that was my career path. And there was a particular driver for me um, in that I really enjoyed uh, my project management work, stressful though it was at times, um, I really enjoyed it and I enjoyed the fact that we could put some structure around something, that we could demonstrate a level of achievement. I guess there were many projects where I felt um, we came to the end of the project and we had fallen short of achieving what was possible. The dream that had kicked the project off never quite became a reality. And in the end, it all often felt just like a very tiring race. So for me, change management and my entry into change management were, was, was founded in a conviction that we could be doing more with the level of investment that we're putting into bringing new capability into our organizations. So whether we're talking about um, relocations, acquisitions and mergers, um, IT developments, uh, business process restructuring, any of those changes um, that require some technical work around new capability, but which are totally reliant on people ad adopting um, that new capability, um, is good space for us to be doing people side work. And you know, the difference between project and change management is much uh, smaller than the similarity because we have as our common objective to add value to the organization that we're working for, whether we're in a not-for-profit environment or a commercial environment. Um, we change for a reason. We invest in a new capability for a reason. And so collectively, we have that goal of wanting to ensure that we add value through the work that we do day to day and that we help the organization achieve the outcomes that they're setting out to achieve. So benefits realization is probably the point at which we stand completely hand to hand from a project management and change management perspective. So having said about the common interest, maybe it's worth just talking a little bit about the characteristics of our two disciplines that may be a little different, although complementary. So from a project management viewpoint, um, we are delivering the technical capability that is, is essential um, to make a change possible. From a change management perspective, we are focusing on ensuring that the change, when it's delivered, is implemented, it's adopted, and it's sustained so that we achieve those benefits. So whereas from a project management viewpoint, we are able to have visibility around a deliverable being in place and being achieved, from a change management viewpoint, our measurement goes well on into the future and is really based on whether we get full-scale adoption and sustained adoption of new ways of working. So that's one comparison. Um, from a methodology and plan perspective, we've got a slight focus. So project management emphasizes the organization of resources and activities required to complete projects. We know it's not quite as simple as that because there's quite a lot of issue management, risk management, um, and certainly change control to operate. Um, but on the change management side, we're emphasizing people side activities required to prepare the organization for change and to facilitate that transition from old ways of working to new ways of working. We're going to talk a little bit more about that um, because we've taken an extract from the standard 
uh, we thought it would be very interesting for you to actually see some of the standard content without having to read the whole document. And so change, uh, being prepared for change readiness is one of the elements that we thought we would talk you through today. So I'll be, I'll be coming back to that. But our fundamental belief is that project management and change management plans should be integrated and um, should operate in an overall plan. One of the questions I get asked quite often is, um, can a project manager also be a change management practitioner? And the answer is, um, of course, because it is a set of um, skills, it is a discipline. However, um, we need to look very closely at the scale of um, our project and the nature of the demand on our time and ask ourselves, ourselves the question about whether we can take this double focus and give it an equal balance. So it's not that change management is mutually exclusive to project management, but as always, it's about understanding the nature of the project, the nature of change that we're trying to deploy, and making sure that we are skilled and resourced to make that a success. Um, um, the difference between um, change management and project management, which you address very well, and one of the interesting questions was, is there funding beyond kind of go live? So whenever, so that's the challenge, right? Because oftentimes when you're doing a business case or creating a project charter, you define the conclusion of the project as go live. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts and experience on that, um, you know, in terms of an organization and, and realizing about it? It's great to talk about the lessons management, but as we, as we shared, it's, it's what happens after you go live. Yes, and actually, I'm afraid I would expand the question. So my, my challenge is, are we even properly considering the funding required prior to go live? So if we think about the fact that it's the individuals in the organization who need to change their ways of working, do we actually cost into our business case for our project the amount of time that business individuals, the employees, the managers, the sponsors of our change, that they're going to need to put into play to make this change successful. So there are two questions. There's a question I think about whether we are properly considering the proper scale of the change and the nature of the funding and the resource deployment that needs to go in to make it a success pre-live and an excellent question about, about post-go live. So I have um, had the benefit of working on some extremely well-structured programs um, so I'm interested in your views, those of you who are working in a purely project management capacity versus those of you who are working in a program environment, because what I tend to find is that when we deploy multi-projects in a program environment, that that thought about sustainability is costed into the overall program business case, whereas for a project business case, it becomes quite difficult to, to have that in play. And something else just to contribute to that is, considering whether or like kind of the amount of change management, because this is the other interesting thing. It's not like a one size fits all that, oh, well, we're going to do change management. Um, one of the ways I interpreted this question is do you always do change management? And I think there's always an appropriate level of communications and training, but that is not what, can, what change management involves. It's a whole lot more than that. And the key thing is the impact on the people. So I had a change recently which was requiring people in an organization to move to smaller spaces. So I don't know if you're familiar with this, it's called space standards in this particular project and people were losing offices, they were being moved to smaller cubes and as a result people were very happy. But guess what? I don't know that change management is going to instantly make people happy because that's not the point. So you have to be smart about how you're going about applying change management to really ensure that you're doing the right thing in terms of adoption. Because space standards, I'm not so sure adoption is the right goal. Yeah, no, and I think it, you know, this is where we're, what we're really talking about is acceptance of change. So um, I, I don't know that there are very many change practitioners expect to get everybody super excited about every change that's happening. But in terms of creating some kind of uh, higher level of change ability in our organizations, we need to get our people to a point where they can accept more change and they can go with it. But also, from our viewpoint, both um, in terms of delivering um, projects and uh, on the change management side of those projects, it is incredibly helpful to understand what it is that people get very angsty about when 
certain changes are brought about. Mm -hmm. So one of the stories I often um, I refer to is the kettle story. Um, Donna, being from the US, is, is more of a coffee person, but we all know that in the UK, you know, our tea is very important to us. So where we make our tea and making sure that we have a kettle um, is pretty important. So when, whether we're talking about those office move projects, Donna, um, kettles uh, is a, it's a frequent uh, topic of conversation. Anyway, moving on, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit more now about the standard. So we are very excited because um, we've been working on the standard for quite some time now. Donna, how, mm -hmm. when, when did we actually begin that process? Yeah, so um, and the standard has been developed by volunteers, and it's been developed by volunteers right across the globe. Um, so when you get a chance, uh, we'll be giving you some information later on about how you'll be able to get uh, access to a copy of the standard. Um, and you'll see from the sheet that we've had involvement from a wide variety of people from a variety of backgrounds and certainly from um, a variety of countries. Um, the standard itself... Um, is a really useful document. So it isn't just a very high level statement. It's got some, I think, very, very practical support in there. Um, and I'm going to go into detail into one of these components in a while so that you can see that. Um, it's got some definitions in it. So um, I think for those of you out there who are practitioners in things like managing successful programs or prints too, um, I think we all know that having a common lang language, a common interpretation, um, can be very helpful. Of course, those of us who are very into our subject matter can spend hours debating the um, true definition of certain words and phrases. But, you know, the standard is intended to be a first delivery into this area. We don't think we've got it all right. So please, when you take a look at it and read it, um, read it in that context that we would love to hear from you about uh, what you think about it, and certainly whether you think it's useful. So it's got some um, definitions, it's got um, process flows in it. So it's been developed in, I think, quite a modern way, um, in that the, these days we're quite familiar with looking at things in a process flow manner. Uh, it might not quite conform to exactly your definition of a standard, but again, I think it makes it very usable. So it's divided into five knowledge areas. And you can see here we've got a bit of a circle going on. And that's because given that change management is a discipline that focuses on outcomes, it means that there's very little about what we do that can be truly sequential. If we find that we're not actually achieving the outcomes, then we will come back and we'll go through the loop again. So this is an iterative process and it's not always sequential. But these are the five main, main components around which the standard is built. So as I said, let's take a, a you know what they call a deeper dive into um, one area of the standard. And I've deliberately not chosen just one of those circles or one chapter. I've chosen what I've called a thread um, that goes right across all of the areas, and that is around um, organizational readiness for change. Now, back in the, the day before I really got involved in change management, um, I used to be quite in awe of people who talked about doing change readiness assessments because they were, as a project manager, it wasn't something I was very familiar with. Um, this piece in the standard goes a lot further than just change readiness assessment. So we do assess readiness, but we're looking at imp change impact as well. We're looking at how we would develop the mechanisms to monitor and check whether we're increasing our readiness for change in general and for a particular change and then how we would modify our activities to reflect that. So um, just looking at um, one of those areas, again, you know, diving down into a slightly lower level of detail and finding my notes here, so excuse the pause. Um, so really, the first one, what we're doing is in, in assessing readiness for change is we're considering a number of things. So overall, we want to consider the preparedness of staff in an organization for change in general and for this change in particular. And why is that important? Well, Donna has already mentioned that one of the trends that we found was that the amount of change is increasing. The other trend that most of the research indicates is that the pace of change is increasing as well. So if we ask the question about which organizations are going to be most successful in the future, we have to come to the conclusion that those organizations 
are going to be the organizations that can um, adopt change more rapidly and adopt more change. So it's the frequency of change as well. And you know, it doesn't matter how beautifully defined our projects are, how well crafted our solutions are, actually we have to do some work around making sure that we have employees in our organization as ready as possible for all the things that are coming down the line. And that's not easy as we all know. So when it comes to readiness, we might be looking at, uh, for example, what changes are happening in the marketplace and how can we use that information to make it evident to, to the, the employees of an organization that either there's a great opportunity uh, that we could take or there's a great threat that we need to avoid. So keeping our staff aware of what's happening out in the market, what competitors are doing, um, really starts to help heighten their state of readiness for change in their own organization particularly if we connect, can, can connect the organization's success with their personal success. Um, now, the second thing really is um, that we need to consider whether we have everybody in the organization working at full tilt already. Because if we do, then we shouldn't be surprised if we find that they are demonstrating a high degree of resistance to change because they haven't got very much headroom for anything other than business or, as usual. Um, maybe the readiness piece is around thinking about what opportunities are happening that create a capacity for change. So, as you know, um, just recently there have been the changes to the pension um, uh, regulations around um, taking lump sum payments. That's had a huge impact on the financial services sector. Some organizations have taken the opportunity of the fact that they, there is a product there that they can't sell and therefore a team who cannot work around that product to create capacity for change others have taken it as a saving. So it, it's about really having a different idea about your people and what they can add to your future development as opposed to just your current business as usual development. So saturation, we need to think about the number of changes that are impacting our staff during a period of time. We are familiar with developing project plans. From a change management perspective, we like to take a look at it from the ground up. So as an individual in the organization, how many changes are heading my way in the next few months? How much is that going to um, have a call on my time, on my attention? How many new things am I going to need to learn? So the saturation part is not so much looking at it as a project portfolio from a board level, from a delivery perspective. It's looking at it from an individual perspective in terms of the amount of changes to they, their ways of working. And of course, saturation will also affect whether somebody is ready for change or not. Um, we, there's, there's that lovely expression we've got it, the straw that breaks the camel's back. So um, also as part of the assessment process, we want to understand what staff think about the change, what they understand the change to be about. You hear so often uh, people saying, I don't really know why they're doing this. Um, so readiness is very much about having people aware and proper, properly understanding why a change is taking uh, place. There are all sorts of ways in which we can um, check that. We can check it formally, informally. One-to-one -one is always best, um, but if we've got working in a particular culture where people don't like to surface these things, we may need to think a little bit more creatively about how we get people to feedback this or, um, around what, why this change is happening. Um, Brianna, and I'd like to address David here. He was talking about how often um, there's this perception that change management is telling the staff about the bright and shiny future. And what you're talking about here is it goes beyond just the bright and shiny future. It's making the case for change. Why is this important? Why does it matter? And how do we help the people who, are, who need to change um, prepare for that? So it's not just the bright and shiny future. And it's also not a scare tactic. Sometimes we hear um, over and over about the burning platform. And I wonder sometimes if people walk around with uh, matches, you know, do we need to light something on fire just to get everybody concerned? And that's not the case either. That's what this really speaks to is the level of readiness in the context of change. Yes, I often think about, um, you know, the way we use salt and pe pepper to season our food. Um, and actually, I think in terms of that, um, making sure that people understand why they can't carry on as they are, as well as understanding why it might be better to operate in a different way. To me, that's the salt and pepper seasoning of change management. So it isn't about scare tactics, but it is about making sure that you get that balance right 
that's sufficiently uncomfortable to carry on as you are, but it, and it's sufficiently attractive to move to something slightly different. So carrying on with this thread then, in the next stage, what we're thinking about is developing um, the change impact and readiness strategy. So, you know, this is where we are very intentional about increasing change readiness. And you know, the, often we, we get to a point where we understand what it is that's getting in the way for people with regards to uh, wanting to adopt new changes. But we don't take the thinking very much further in terms of how can we remove barriers. And, you know, what, for a classic example for us uh, around how you help people get more engaged is by getting them more involved. So rather than having something happen to them, um, we would advocate under our discipline that involvement is a, is a key element in securing people's um, willingness to travel along the transition path into a future state. Now, I'm going to be maybe slightly controversial here, but I feel I can say this as a former project manager myself. Um, Co-creation, collaboration, opening up the discussion can all sound slightly scary if you're a project manager with a very tight deadline and a very clear set of deliverables um, to put in place. Um, and so I feel sometimes um, the way in which we structure our projects mitigates against us having the sort of collaboration with the staff who are really going to have to adopt the new, new ways of working for fear that we're going to end up you know, burning the midnight oil, developing change control notices with costs escalating, out of control of timescales. Now I think some of the work that we're doing um, around agile at the moment, around iterative um, development, um, all of that kind of plays into this uh, collaboration workspace. But what we need to bear in mind is that each individual in the organization needs to have a voice in, if they're to, to help with their own readiness. So we can't just neatly gather together a bunch of representatives. We have to really think about how we do that collaboration on quite a, a board basis. So I just wanted to give you um, an example of that. Um, you know, I think there's a big plus. Under the right conditions, by um, having staff involved in our projects, then we may be able to reduce some unnecessary, unnecessary complexity. We might be able to eliminate some processes. We might be able to reduce the cost of some of our projects. But certainly, what they will leave with is a positive experience of having been involved in a successful delivery. And that in itself is the other critical element in making sure that people feel ready for more change. So then at the next point, what we're doing is developing some mechanisms so that we can monitor whether we are actually uh, achieving our plan um, and finding out whether we need to make some adjustments. So finding um, you know, tangible measures can be, can be tricky. Um, but we might need to look at things like um, staff turnover, absence, impacts on productivity, variations in customer complaints during a period of particular change. Those could all be quite tangible indicators of how change resistant people are. I, I just want to, I guess this is a good moment because we keep talking about change resistance. I just want to point out, um, I think a lot of people are actually very change ready. Um, so I don't want to create the impression that we're, you know, all constantly dragging everybody kicking and screaming. We're not. We know we're not. Um, but actually, our goal is about achieving the maximum outcome that is possible. And to do that, it means that we need to look at the people who are going to be resistant as well as the people who are going to be willing. So Donna, any comments on that? Oh, absolutely. I agree. And sometimes, just as a, an aside on the resistance point, Rhiannon, is that resistance can be a very positive thing. Um, what you need to be careful of are people who are silent or quiet. So in the context of a change, when there are people who are resistant, I've experienced on projects where those folks who are pushing back actually end up contributing some really excellent insight and they help um, make some modifications or changes to the project itself that ends up in a better result and outcome simply because they were bringing their perspective. And to your point earlier about being collaborative and being engaged with people, sometimes it's just a matter of listening and having the conversations. People need time to process what's going on and how they can um, personally understand and make sense of the change. And um, to somebody's comment earlier, it's about a mindset shift in some cases. 
um, while you may be doing a new process, using a new system, sometimes it's a matter of changing how you think. And that's a very challenging thing to do. Yeah, and just another point on this uh, change readiness piece that connects, again, the project management and change management um, sides together. You know, the, one of the metaphors I have in mind for this, don't know whether it's a, an appropriate metaphor, but it certainly made a big impact on me. I went along to see the Paralympics in London, and um, we managed tickets to go um, to see athletics. And we saw some of the um, visually impaired uh, runners running with their partners with that little um, piece that they have tied to the two wrists. And this is the picture that really comes to mind for me when we're talking about change readiness, because we need to work so um, much in harmony from a people readiness and a capability readiness perspective that um, we need to pace the delivery of our capability so that it launches at the point where people are ready to take it on. But we need to have people ready to take it on at the point where we are good to launch. So it's that wonderful harmony that we're looking for. And if we can optimize that, then it means that we will never again send people along to a training course where they're saying, tell me again, why am I here? So that's a kind of practical example of if we get this readiness piece right, where we're optimizing both the technical delivery and the change management side of things. So the other thread I was just going to mention, I'm going to spend much less time on this, even though it's a very important topic, which is around sponsorship. So sponsorship for change is um, a critical element in, um, the, in achieving a successful outcome. And one of the things that as change practitioners, um, we've learned both through research and our own experience um, is that however good we are at standing up and speaking, however charismatic we might be, however passionate we are about what it is um, that we're wanting to, to change, the people that are listened to are not us. It's not us, it's not the project managers, it's not the program managers, it's the business leaders. So um, identifying the sponsors who are li listened to in an organization and therefore who are highly influential is a critical element in developing a people side strategy. Um, we also need to understand the accountability um, and we need to be sure that they themselves are aligned and committed to the change. You know, the great don't talk the talk, walk the walk saying, um, very, very um, important that we see our leaders demonstrating the sort of behaviors that we're expecting through the change so that that can be followed by um, staff. Um, and so developing a sponsorship strategy um, is a key part of uh, leading the charge, if you like, in terms of making, a, making sure that a change happens. And I think it's a good correlation between the um, way in which we need to identify sponsors um, that we talk about in the standard and the way we talk about business change management and uh, managing successful prog programs the way we talk about the role of the sponsor, um, the senior responsible officer. So I, I would say um, we do have some quite good uh, practices around ident identifying our sponsors. Um, it would be a good conversation to have at some later point around how well do we prepare them for doing the job that they have to do. Absolutely. And uh, David Arnold made the comment, that's great that you identify them, but absolutely how effective are they? And uh, then we chipped in, um, uh, Alex said, by sponsors, the term in the UK would typically be called senior stakeholders, just a point of clarification there. Um, and then there was a, a clarifying question here from Anessa, who was asking, do you mean change management sponsors or project sponsors? So I think that's a, a good question. And I, um, I think that rather than worrying too much about the title and um, what we need to do is to be clear about what the terms of reference are. So when we are talking about sponsors under the change management umbrella, we're talking about people who are going to ensure that the outcomes are achieved. Now in order to ensure that the outcomes are achieved, the capability also needs to be put in place. So um, the sponsorship picture for a small project uh, I would expect to be less complex from a project delivery perspective, but maybe quite complex from a 
change sponsor perspective because it could be a small technical change that impacts a large number of people. For example, again, let's pick something that's always controversial, a change to the performance management system. Actually, the technical side of that change may be very small, but the impact will go right across the organization and therefore sponsorship needs to be broad. Rhiannon, this is a conversation we could probably have for an entire hour because sponsorship is so critical. In fact, it's um, consistently shown that good sponsorship um, or senior stakeholder um, participation is really the key to success in, in the outcomes. And I've seen that again and again where you can do a project health tech and you can say everything about the project is going swimmingly well but the person who's responsible, the influencer who's responsible for from a senior level is not doing their job as a sponsor and consequently the project ends up not being as successful as it could have been. Yeah, I think one encouraging factor is that in the course of our work what we find is that one of the main reasons why sponsors are not doing a great job is because they don't really know what they should be doing. So that says to me that you know, change management has something to bring to the table in terms of helping those sponsors achieve clarity over what we're expecting of them. So we said we would talk a little about what's next. Um, so Donna, do you, would you give us an update on the public release of the standard and maybe explain a little bit about why we've decided to do it this way? Sure. So the standard, um, in, in practicing change management, we wanted to give an opportunity for the members of ACMP to review and um, understand the standards. So it's been released um, to the members of ACMP, but it will be available complimentary to anybody starting October 2nd. And in just a moment, we'll give you um, an indication of how you can get your copy. And then some other things that we're going to be doing are the uh, professional credential, again, different than a certification. And that professional credential work will consist of an application indicating your experience, education, and an exam. There'll be a qualified education provider program. And then we're also working on um, partnerships with complementary disciplines. There's been a lot of questions in the question panel asking about how this connects with organizations. And our position is not one of you know, trying to own the space, but instead one of partnership and collaboration. So it's our goal to help advance the discipline and whoever is partnering with, with us and working together, um, we can make change better for the world. That would be our goal. It's not about um, you know, who has it right, it's about how we collectively can advance. So we'll be um, having outreach to various organizations, individuals, and again, focusing our goal on helping do change better. How can we be more successful? in the practice of change. So here's a slide that explains to you how you can go and get a copy of the ACMP standard for change management. We would ask that you would um, read the standard, use it, apply it, and please tell your colleagues about it. Again, it's available to anybody, available to the general public October 2nd, and you've heard it here first. Donna, thank you very much. So, yeah, you can see we're very keen to make this available widely because at the core of our purpose in ACMP is advancing the discipline of change management. And we think that uh, change management is something that's for everybody, not just for a small number of um, specialists. So that's why we've been very keen to, to make it available wide, wide, widely. The quote I'd like you to reflect on is that man cannot discover new oceans unless he has the courage to lose sight of the shore. So we wish each and every one of you the courage to lose sight of your shoreline in the interest of discovering new oceans. 